In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, it says this, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. The preaching of the cross is really the power of God. It's not getting wet in the baptistry. It's not living a life that pleases God, because I have news for you, friends. You can't, leave, you can't live a life good enough to really please God. It's about the cross of Jesus Christ. You know the world looks at that as foolishness. It says that the preaching of the cross is to them that bears foolishness. People look around us and say, and, and, and they, they chalk it up to, to uh, blind faith. They say, well, this is, I don't understand this. This is, this is foolishness that you would preach the cross. And I think humanity wants to say that that the baptistry really has some ability to save us. They want to say that our money in the offering plate has some ability to save us, or, or maybe our good works, or, or maybe our, uh, something we do, somehow we can save ourselves. But you know what the Bible says? The verse prior to verse 18, verse 17, 1 Corinthians 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. If baptism was all that important to be saved, don't you think the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, would say, for Christ sent me not to preach the gospel, but to baptize? I'm thankful that we have baptism. But baptism does not save you. Your works don't save you. You're being a good person. You can be good, and being good is good, but being good isn't good enough to get you to heaven. You've got to be perfect. And we're only made perfect by the cross, not water baptism. And I thank God for this. I thank God for John the Baptist. And we're going to look at some growth principles here from his life. We've talked about so many people. We talked about Joseph and David, and we, we've talked about uh, uh, people we've learned from their mistakes, like Judas, Peter. And, but this is a great example of a good example, John the Baptist. So I want you to jot down in your notes as you open up to John chapter 1, John chapter 1, I want you to write down point 1, which is he had one purpose. He had one purpose. And that purpose, in its simplest form, was preparing the way. That was what it was about, preparing the way. Finding your purpose in life is really powerful. I don't know how many people in this room at times, in times past, have struggled with finding the purpose for their existence, you know? I mean, we ask ourselves this question, like, why am I here today? <laughs> Hopefully, you all know why you're here today, you know. But we ask, our, what is our purpose in life? These, these soul-stirring questions, what is the reason for my existence? Listen, friends, if, if, if we are some uh, product of, of some evolutionary accident, then we have no purpose. And then can I just be a discouragement to you today? Go home. If we're an accident, why are you here? But if you really believe in, in, in the sovereignty of God that he created us, then let me tell you, you're in the right place. You are in the place of God today. I don't know, finding purpose is, is wonderful. Matter of fact, I wrote a whole book on that called Finding Purpose. <laughs> now that I think about it. Actually, I didn't write the book. I just preached the sermon. Where's Joel? He wrote the book. In John chapter 1, Verses 6 to 9, we see John the Baptist's purpose. And I want to be very clear. There's a difference between John the Baptist and the Apostle John. So listen very carefully. John, the Gospel of John says this in verse 6. John 1, verse 6. There was a man sent from God. Now when you read this, that just blows your mind. There was a man sent from God. When I, when I read that, just that one line, and I began to just kind of meditate on that one thought. There was a man sent from God. Isn't that neat? That there were people that God had sent to us. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, speaking of John the Baptist, but was sent to bear witness of that light. 
That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. John the Baptist had one purpose. We find, as we read further in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, he says this, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I. What a great declaration. Whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. John says, I'm coming just to baptize you with water. But let me tell you what, there's coming one after me who's much mightier than I am that's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. You see, John had a purpose, and his purpose was to pave the road for others to drive on. His purpose was, in a sense, to kind of roll out the red carpet for the Messiah. This was his purpose. Preparing the way. And when it comes to what we can learn from John the Baptist with regards to growth, it's actually very, very simple. And it's simply this. Sometimes your growth is to help the growth of others. If you want to grow this year, we need to examine this very carefully because sometimes God has put you in the life of others to help them. Now, there's a lot of times we don't think that way. There are people who don't want to grow. There are others that don't want other people to grow. But sometimes your growth is to help the growth of others. Maybe your one purpose might be to help others discover their purpose. It might be that your one purpose is to help others fulfill their purpose. Isn't it neat that maybe God has for you to help other people? There are a lot of people who want all the glory for themselves, though. There are people that say, uh, look what I've done. Look what I've accomplished. Look who I am, who like to brag on themselves. There are a lot of people who like to brag on themselves. These, these, can I give you a, a, just a caution? Stay away from people who brag on themselves. You know, get around those people who like to brag on other people. I, I'm not saying that I'm perfect at this, but I like to brag on other people. I like, to, I like to brag on, on my staff. I like to brag on my boys. My boys do a great job singing. I'm sure they get it from their, their well, from me. No. They get their looks from me. That's why they're so handsome. They get their looks from their mother. They get the singing ability from their mother. They, uh, I love uh, talking positively about my staff and, and all the things that, that people do. Uh, I can't put together a video. I can't hardly do a selfie video. And Brooks, he's the real magic behind that. I can't, uh, I can't organize things, not like Rebecca can organize things. Uh, Joel, he, he writes the books. Lydia helps proof the books. If there's an error in the books, it's Lydia's fault. Just want to say that. <laughs> Amen. Amen. She accepts responsibility. See how that works? Get around people who, who are helping other people to grow. Uh, oftentimes, these people, and there are people that struggle with uh, helping others achieve their goal because then they win. Yeah, if, if this is a race where there's only one winner, uh, people, people like to cheat. They like to hold people back from being successful. They, 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 they don't want to help other people achieve a goal. They don't want to be a blessing to people because then they're better than them, and, and you don't want that either. You, know, you want to hold people down. You want to... Uh, Keep them in their place. You don't want to go out there and help other people be successful. And this is how some people think. But this is not the way John the Baptist thought. You see, he was able to understand this one principle of my job is to help him do his job. Make his path straight. John's purpose was to fulfill Jesus' purpose, to help Jesus fulfill his own purpose. And, and let me say this, too, and I, and, I, and I want to say this. There can only be one president of the United States. You understand that. And, and, and all of his cabinet, all of his administration, you know what the role of the administration is? It's a supportive administration. It's to help the president do his job. There can only be one president. And I tell you, when, when we drove in the, well, I, I don't know what it was, this last year I was able to drive in the motorcade. It was pretty cool. We saw Air Force One land on the tarmac, and, and then the vice president's plane was over here, and then, 
And then the, the, the main, the main uh, Cadillac, which is called the Beast, it's really cool, it's 20,000 pounds, it's a Cadillac stretch limousine kind of thing, and uh, they had cars in front of it and cars behind it, they had gunmen you know, on top of the buildings, and they had, they had people everywhere spread about, it was such an orchestration, it was really cool to see it. And then I got to drive in the motorcade, and I'm just driving, you know, and, and they, said, they said to me, they said, if you can't keep up with the president, you're not supposed to, <laughs> which I thought was kind of fun. So, but we got to run all the red lights, and all, all the streets were all barricaded, and you, you just see all of what was happening. There can only be one president. Everyone else supports him. Everybody else's goal is a supportive role. You know, let me tell you this, and I, and I say this humbly, there can only be one pastor, one senior pastor. And everybody else's role is to support the senior pastor in his role. I don't say that arrogantly, I mean that. And, and honestly, I, there, are, there are times I feel uh, uh, a pampered. I do, I feel pampered. I, I, somebody brings me my coffee, and somebody cleans my office, and somebody, somebody does, does my administration. And sometimes I just feel like, well, I mean, I can't believe they pay me to do this. And you know what? Everybody is in that supportive role. There can only be one boss. And there can only be one Jesus. Our job is to help Jesus. Now, we say, well, that's arrogant, because he could do it all by himself. He could, but he chose us to help him. Now, that's neat. We are his instruments, the tools, the vessel that he has chosen to use to accomplish his purpose. There can only be one Jesus. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And you know who that is? That's Jesus. Aren't you thankful that there's only one God? Could you imagine having to serve two different gods? You see, oh, it's impossible to, to, serve, to serve two gods. Let me give you just a quick application. When it comes to growth this year, we need to support help others along their journey of growth. We need to help other people on their journey of growth. Let's not be selfish that we want the glory for ourselves. And there are a lot of people who are so proud of what they've done. The Bible says, let another man praise thee and not thy own mouth. Let someone else praise you. It's not about you praising yourself, tooting your own horn, saying how good you are, or how great you are, or what you've done, or, or, or something. It's, it's about you getting behind the, the Lord, getting behind other people. Let me give you an, an example of a supportive role. Uh, I'm trying to train my children to be, to be young men, and uh, to be godly young men. And my, my job as a parent is to help support them in whatever they need in order to train them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. My goal is a supportive role. Not a tyrannical role, not, not a, 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 a dictatorship per se, but it's my goal is to help train. The word train means to straighten. It's to try to get my child to take that straight and narrow path. That's what my goal is, as training up a child in the way of the Lord. Right? Train up a child in the way of the Lord. The way you should go, you shouldn't should depart from it. So my goal is to kind of put him on that straight and narrow, supportive role. My, my role for my wife is to do whatever I can to make her be successful in her Christian life. How can I make it easy on my wife? How can I make it easy on my kids? How can I make it easy on uh, other leaders and, and other authorities around me? How can I be supporting my wife? And you know what's interesting? Is my wife's role as a helpmeet is to support me in my, in my adventure of supporting her. That's what the helpmeet does. She's helping me. Years ago, I remember one of the pastor, pastor's wives on staff of the church came from, she said this. It was really, really great. She said, my role is to help my husband do whatever, or not help, keep my husband is the words, keep my husband doing whatever he's doing for the longest period of time. That was the goal, supportive role. How can we be a support and help others achieve success in growth around us? I mean, that is exactly what John the Baptist did. 
He was able to, uh, to focus, in a sense, on this one role of how can we prepare, how can he prepare the way of the Lord? And what's interesting, he never took credit for it. He didn't take credit, take, didn't take God's credit. I've, I've given you this quote before. I think it's very fitting. There is a quote that sat on Ronald Reagan's desk. And it just simply said that there is no limit to the amount of good you can do if you don't care who gets the credit. Who cares about the credit? Who cares about the credit? I want to do good, and I don't care who gets the credit for the good. I don't care that I, 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 want, I want to help my kids be successful spiritually. I want to help them be successful financially. And one day, Lord willing, they'll have more money. Well, they already have more money than I have, but they're going to be financially successful. And they're going to look at me, and they say, well, Dad, we couldn't have done it without you. And I said, no, no, I couldn't have done it without you. It's, it's about acknowledging that someone else deserves the credit. And that's what John the Baptist did. He acknowledged that one mightier than him, one mightier than him was coming. So we see that he had one purpose. Secondly, we look at he had one practice. So number one, he had one purpose. Secondly, he had one practice. And this, this one practice really centered around his declaration that we find in, uh, in John chapter 1. And so here was his declaration, and, and it was just real simply, John declared his support for another. This is what he did. He declared his support for another. John 1, verse 15 to 17, John bare witness, it says, of him and cried, saying, this was he of whom I spake. This was his declaration. Ah, this is the guy. This is, this is the one that I'm speaking of, he says. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. This guy who's mightier than I am, this is the guy. Verse 16, and of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Grace and truth came by him. We get down to verse 29, and the, the, the most uh, wonderful declaration of 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 God was made here in verse 29. He says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him. So there he was. He was baptizing in the Jordan. He looks off in the distance, and here comes the one mightier than him. Here comes the one whose shoes that John is not worthy to stoop down and loose. This is the guy. This is the one. I've paved the road. I've laid out the red carpet. He's the one. Ready? Here's what he says. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. You can't have a more excellent statement than that. This is the Lamb of God. You see, up until this point, there were sacrifices that were made that were made as a covering for sin. Now comes on the scene Jesus, who is the Lamb of God, who's when blood is shed, doesn't cover sin. He takes away the sin. I'm so thankful that we have a God who doesn't just cover our sin for us, but actually takes it and pays for it. He takes away the sin of the world. I want to note here that it's important to declare who it is we're supporting. Like John declared Jesus, this is the guy that I'm supporting, this is the one. If you are called to a position of support, be the best support that you can be. If you are a servant, then tell other people who your master is. This is the one. It's this guy. He's the guy that's mightier than me, preferred before me. This guy, he's the one I'm behind. It's amazing how many times we're afraid to tell people who we support. We're afraid, to, we're afraid to say who it is we're behind. Who are you behind? Well, I just would rather not say. 
People don't want to say what church they go to. They don't want to say where they work. People want to say who the political affiliation is. People want to say that they support police officers. They're just scared to death of that for some reason. The people that are out to protect them, they're scared to, they're afraid to say that we defend these people, you know. And people are so afraid to say who it is they support. But John, he wasn't afraid to say who he supported. He said, this is the guy. That's the boss. Tell others of your supportive role. Let them know that you are there to support their purpose. You know what kind of, you know what kind of strength that gives to people? When, when there are people that say, hey, listen, uh, you know, we, we, we serve at the pleasure of the president, or you know, we're behind you. you know, those words, we're behind you, are big words. They're so small, but they mean so much. We're behind you. We, we got your back. We support you. We got a, we got a sign the other day from the, the prayer thing, and it says, uh, we support our, our police officers. Thank an officer today. We've got a few more of those signs if you want them. I think we, uh, we hoarded them. I think we did. How many did we, we end up with? That means like 10. I don't know means 10. I think we have like at least a dozen of these things. So if you want one, uh, you stick it in your yard and, and uh, expect to get persecuted, unfortunately. But uh, you know what? Here's the thing. Aren't you glad that we can say who we support? Just like John the Baptist. Mean, if you want to grow this year, you've got to learn some of these things that sometimes growth isn't about you, it's about someone else. It's about getting behind, putting your shoulder behind the plow of someone else who's got the blade. I mean, it's about saying, I will stand with so-and-so. I will get behind them, I will support them, I will love them. Not be afraid to do it. You say to people, I'm here to help. One, one commentator, uh, he said this, John the Baptist was sent for people's benefit to be an additional pointer to the truth of Jesus, the revealer of the Father. People in, he goes on to say, people in sin are in such darkness that they need someone to tell them what is light. There's so much pollution out there, so much sin. We need someone to come along and say, this is the true light. This is the one that's mightier than I am. This is the one that I'm supporting. I'm behind Jesus. I mean, he declared his support for another. But he did another thing. He didn't just declare his support for another. He denied himself. He denied himself. In John 1, uh, 19 through 20, and this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who art thou? This is when John the Baptist, he could have puffed out his chest and said, well, I am pretty good. Yep, I am not as mighty, but I'm pretty good. But you know what he said? He said this in verse 20, he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. I am not the one in charge. I am not the leader. I'm not the captain. There is someone that's mightier than I am. This is the guy that I'm supporting. Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. It's him. This is a bizarre paradox in the Christian growth and in growth in general. Growth requires you to deny your own goals to help others achieve theirs. Well, it's such a weird paradox. How can I, you know, most people are just, they're in it for themselves and they just, they just want to achieve their own goal. But I tell you what, growth this year requires you to deny yourself your growth and say, but you know what, there's somebody that I'm going to get behind. There's somebody that I am helping to be successful. And ironically, you know what happens? When they're successful, we talked about this several weeks ago, when they're successful, you're successful. When you're successful, they're successful. Now, it, it, you know, that's not the reason you do it. But it's just a matter of fact, it's a law of reciprocation. You help other people achieve their goal, you're going to be better for it. That's not why you do it, though. You do it because that's what it's about. It's about preparing the way for other people. You see, many people think that growth requires you to kind of give in to your every impulse, you know? 
I'm just going to give in to every impulse I have. I just have this craving, this I'm going to climb my way to the top despite anybody else. I'm going to step on the little man. Selfishness. Selfishness in the growth circle. I will grow at the expense of other people. And you know what John did? He was able to deny himself. I think one of the top goals of this year, growth goals, should be that we deny ourselves, we talked about that several weeks ago, for the purpose of helping other people achieve their goal. It's about putting others first. It's about saying no to yourself, saying, I'm going to help somebody else. I'm going to help the little man. I'm going to help someone be successful. And you know what? When you make provision for others to be successful, you're successful. So make provision for others to succeed. Make provision for others to succeed. Growth is up. And in helping others is a, is a wonderful area to grow. And stay away from those people who are trying to prohibit or limit the growth of others. You want to get behind those people that say, hey, man, I want to be the guy who helps other people get where they need to be. That's where you want to be. That's, that's the zone that you want to be in, just like John the Baptist. He didn't take any glory from himself. He said, the purpose that I'm here, I'm sent from God, and the purpose I'm here, the very purpose, is to make the path straight. I'm here to baptize with water, but somebody mightier than I is going to come. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. He's much better than me. And he's so good that I'm not worthy to stoop down and loosen his shoes. Now, can you imagine that? That's putting another before himself. And then when they said, but, but who are you? He says, I'm not the Christ. This is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Can I just encourage you this morning to know your purpose? Know your purpose. But can I also encourage you to practice your purpose? Practice your purpose. Deni uh, declare who you're supporting and deny who you're not supporting. Just say, you know what, I'm, I'm not supporting myself here. I'm not in it for me. I'm in it for you. I want you to achieve success even, even at my expense. And this is what John the Baptist did. I tell you, we have, we, have such, we have such a distance to grow, don't we? And this is just one area that we can grow. Know your purpose and practice your purpose. Put it into action. Don't just sit around and say, well, I know what I'm supposed to do and not do it. The Bible says, he that knoweth to do good and doeth not to him it is sin. So you know what? I know what I'm supposed to do and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to implement it and I'm going to be the person that I ought to be for Jesus Christ. Prepare his way for him. You know, it's interesting, as a Christian, that's what our goal is. You know, a Christian just li means little Christ. I mean, we're, we're here. At, we've placed our faith in Jesus Christ alone as our Savior, right? We've done that. We're embarking on this, uh, on this journey of discipleship. We want to be conformed into the image of his Son, we, we, we want that. We, we don't want to be ashamed before him at his coming. 1 John chapter 2. We don't want that. We are, we are trying to be the best that we can be for the Lord. Not to be saved, but because we are saved. And our job here is to tell other people about Jesus Christ. This is the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. And then, and then baptize them. I mean, go into all the world, go out there, make disciples, preach the gospel, make disciples. This is the greatest thing that Jesus, this is the very last thing that Jesus said. The last thing he said should be, our, our, should be our first command. Go out there and proclaim the gospel message that Jesus died for you. What a wonderful testimony that is, too, when you can go out to other people and say, you know what, Jesus died for me. And he died for you. The difference may be that I've trusted him as my Savior. I haven't trusted in my works, in my water baptism, in my church membership, in my goodness, in my political affiliation. 
I haven't trusted in my family. I have trusted that Jesus died for me. And you know what? Then he rose again. Reminded of the song we sing at Easter. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I don't know about you. There's a lot of people out there that say that Jesus is not real. He's not God, and he didn't come back from the grave. But if he didn't come back from the grave, he's not our Savior. He died, he was buried, and he rose again the third day to prove to God the Father that his payment on the cross was sufficient to pay for your sin. I want this hand right here to represent you and me and this wallet to represent all of our sin. This is you and me. This is our sin. This is, uh, this is Howard Moeller. And this is Ben Huss. And this is Lydia Collison and Andy Shipman. And this is all of the things that they've done wrong, all of our sin. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Someone has to die. The wages of sin is not water baptism or church membership. The wages of sin is death. Did you hear that, church? The wages of sin is not giving your money. The wages of sin is death. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ died on the cross to make the payment for your sin. And the Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not of water baptism. It's, uh, it's not of living a good life. It's not of giving money. It's not of works. It goes on to say, lest any man should boast. Because you know what? If I could get there by my own merit, I'd be bragging about it. Because God knows me better than me. I'd be like, look what I did, Lord. I got baptized. I gave some money. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. It's when you believe in the quietness of your mind, Jesus died for you, was buried and rose again the third day. It's faith alone in Jesus Christ alone that gets you heaven.